Hello. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm glad you could join us via this live stream. My name is Timothy Carr. I am the Senior Director of Strategy and Communications for Free Press and Free Press Action. Um, we are uh, here today to talk about a law that's almost 25 years old. Uh, Section 230 was a part of the Communications Decency Act that Congress passed in 1996. So it's been around for a while, but we've only really recently been hearing more and more about this law. Um, not only do we have an executive order from the White House that seeks to um, change or modify Section 230 in certain ways, we also have legislation in Congress. Um, there is a proceeding at the FCC which could result in restri restrictions to Section 230 as well. So while we're seeing a lot of activity in Washington and hearing a lot about it in the media and elsewhere, um, it, um, it's possible that a lot of people uh, don't really understand what's going on here, what all, all, all of this is about. Um, we're very lucky today to have with us a senior policy counsel from Free Press, uh, uh, Gaurav Laroya and Carmen Scarato, and who will be explaining some of this to us. And uh, we will get to some questions uh, for them uh, very soon. But first, we'd like to hear a little bit from you. Um, is it possible that you could share your location in comments? So we, we uh, just to let us know where you're watching from. Um, and as well, you could sign up uh, to join our work to uh, fight hate online using some of the links that will be available in the comments. Um, and we also encourage you to share the link to this video with others who might be interested in this conversation. So we'll be, uh, we'll be looking for your comments there and we'll be looking uh, for more information, interested in engaging you with you, talking with you in all sorts of ways. Um, but let's get started. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask Gaurav and Carmen. Uh, let's start with a little bit of history. Uh, Gaurav, why did Congress see Section 230 as necessary in 1996 when it uh, passed the Communications Decency Act? Uh, yeah, well, so hi, thanks for uh, Free Press for putting this together and us to be able to, you know, kind of share our thoughts and ideas about where the 230 debate is. Uh, I do think understanding a little bit of the history of this law is necessary to understanding what it does and why it exists and how it was written the way it was and what its authors were trying to accomplish. And, and that is that I think without Section 230 written the way it is, online forms, you know, social media, may well never have existed or you know, been litigated to death at the beginning of the web. Uh, the, the bit of legal history is that two court cases really shaped the legal landscape for online platforms before uh, 1996's Section 230. In the early 90s, defamatory torts, now those are civil legal actions for offenses about speech like defamation or libel, uh, bumped up against new technology. And then Congress decided to chart a new and different path for websites different than um, you know, newspapers and, and things like that. So the first case that, that really matters here uh, is from 1991, it's called Cubby versus CompuServe. And the short of it is a district court decided that because CompuServe was operating an online forum, but it didn't moderate its forums at all. So therefore, it was you couldn't sue CompuServe if someone put up a defamatory speech that was, you know, slandered somebody. You couldn't go after CompuServe for that person's speech. The the court said, you know, CompuServe has no more editorial control over such publication than does a library, bookstore, newsstand, and it's not feasible for CompuServe to examine every single post uh, for potentially defamatory statements. And I think that was a recognition of the court about you know, what was happening even at early internet scale. So you know, in other words, the court said that CompuServe for not moderating the comments on its own webs on its own internet service was immune as, as the carrier for defamatory statements on its service. Now this bumped up, this is the other side of the equation, this bumped up against a 1995 case, which is really important called Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy. Prodigy aimed to be a family-friendly internet service. It wanted to moderate its online forums for its subscribers to protect children and to, you know, to foster a kind of healthy moderated 
debate on its website. It was also sued for hosting you know, a defamatory statement on its site against a company, in fact. The, this, a court in this instance held that because Prodigy's you know, decisions altered the scenario from the CompuServe case, it said that because, Compu, uh, because Prodigy was exercising editorial control or moderating its site, it was as legally responsible for anything anyone said on its site as, as say, a newspaper is. So that means, uh, you know, if that court decision, you know, was followed through, the, you know, CompuServe's lawyers, its, its editorial board would, would have to basically vet every single statement published on the um, uh, Prodigy's website because they were engaging in, you know, any sort of content moderation at all. So, so this created a really perverse incentive. It meant that you know, online sites had two choices, either unfiltered stream of posts, whether that you know, includes spam, hate speech, um, you know, other offensive kinds of content, or if they wanted to you know, take away you know, uh, the worst kinds of speech or just create a, you know, a more uh, sane environment, they'd be subject to public uh, liability like a newspaper for anything on their site. And so Congress in that instance in 1996, you know, uh, wrote section 230, which became part of the, um, the Communications Act, which is still law, which said that, you know, no provider of an interactive computer service so that is, you know, a website or other online service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. That means that like, uh, you know, Facebook, YouTube isn't legally responsible for the things I say on that site. And 230 gives them the right to moderate the, their own websites as they see fit. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of two-sided power of Section 230. It, it, it allows these sites to, to exist. So uh, you, you threw around a few names there, CompuServe, Prodigy, those, for those of us who were around in 1996 and uh, were online, um, you know, you might be familiar with those names, but um, uh, a lot has happened in the past 25 years. And a question I have is how um, has this early internet legislation that you've just described translated to the present day? Um, I mean, particularly, you know, how responsible is Section 230 for the emergence of these so-called new gatekeepers, giant online platforms like Facebook, which has more than 2.5 billion regular users, Twitter and YouTube and others. I mean, um, sure, CompuServe, Prodigy were a force in 1996, but nothing compared to the Internet platforms that we see today. Has Section 230 kept up? Sure. Well, so, you know, I th and if for the question, you know, how has Section 230 led to the emergence of the, uh, these, these sites, I'd say it's integral to it, right? You've, you know, if you're talking about, you know, any of the sites where multiple people, like multiple millions of people communicate on regularly, the, the, the first court I mentioned, I think actually did, did recognize the, the fundamental impossibility of imposing liability for every utterance on that site um, by the site itself. Right? There's no way you would have these kind of gigantic forums that have really reduced the cost of speaking online to nearly zero, right? You sign up for an account on one of these, you know, admittedly huge sites at this point. You will have the ability to post, you know, most anything you, you know, that, that you would like to say or, or engage with on that site without the owners of that site, you know, having to put a timeout, run everything that you say through their legal process, to make sure it's not running afoul of any, you know, uh, you know, libel or other legal uh, liability for that site, and then allowing it to be published, and then the responsibility that the law affords those sites is that actually, if you do go against their, um, you know, their content guidelines, you know, their community standards, they also have the right to refuse, you know, to host the speech that you do, kind of like, you know, um, uh, and so, so in that way. It's really integral to the ability of social media sites that have tens of thousands, millions or billions of users to exist at all. Great, and Carmen, you and Garth um, recently wrote about Section 230 and I thought a really important passage in that piece that was posted at TechDirt. Um, you say that uh, Section 230 strikes a balance between the needs of users to speak and organize via platforms 
and the the needs of those platforms to to moderate to to make reasonable choices about what content is appropriate and, and what is not and um, uh, this also this balance is also important I think to addressing the proliferation of hateful activities via the services can you explain you know Gaurav has given us a very good um, start on this but can you explain in a little bit more detail the importance of of striking this balance and and uh, how section 230 plays a key role in that sure absolutely so hi everyone um, and thank you Gaurav for that historical background on Section 230, because I think it is something that gets lost in the current debate. Um, and I think one of, you know, one of the things I want to emphasize, when you go back to these pair of cases, if you moderated content, you are going to be held liable, you were, could get sued. If you didn't moderate, then you were fine. So Section 230 had to strike a balance. Um, and what it does is it does exactly what Greg barrier so that you and I can speak on these websites, post what we want to post, but it also clarifies that these platforms have the right to moderate the content on their platforms the way that they see fit. So it seems more intuitive, but what we're actually saying here is that you, have, you need to keep 230 to allow the type of moderation that is necessary to fight hate speech to fight this information and to fight propaganda on these websites. And the reason that we want to do that is because we know that some of these things that are pro proliferating on these websites, some of this hate speech is leading to real world consequences. So we still think that these companies need to be held accountable um, and fairly moderate and fairly enforce um, you know, their platforms, but section 230 is not the way to do it. Um, so, so, uh... So what scenarios then do you see should this balance be upset? I, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are a number of legislative initiatives. There's something going on at the FCC. There's the executive order from the Trump administration that seeks to, to modify uh, Section 230, in, in some cases in pretty dramatic ways. And uh, it, should that change upset this sort of balance between uh, the freedom of, of, of uh, people to speak and use the platforms to share ideas? Uh, and the rights of the platforms themselves to moderate this content. If you take that away, what kind of scenarios do you see? I mean, could, it, um, could you give people some sense of what could happen? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the issue is that we, there's too much that could happen and too much that could go wrong by upsetting the balance. So we see a lot of extremes. We could go back to what Gaurav was describing prior to Section 230, where these companies may not want to moderate content on their platforms because they'll they maybe get sued. So they they may do that, and then that'll lead to this like toxic environment online um, or on their platform. Or we may see the opposite, which is that they'll erect these barriers to speak, so that if you or I are trying to post. They may want to pre-screen everything and make sure that they wouldn't be exposed to some legal liability by posting our content. So I think there's just so many different things. And I think what, what happens is that when you upset this balance, you're going to get a parade of unintended consequences. So if you change it, there may it actually may end up hurting some of the communities and some of the speech that we want to protect online. Great, thank you. And um, so I'm curious also um, about um, this idea that a lot of social movements have been organized with the help of online platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Um, it's been important, I know, to the Black Lives Matter movement to be able to use some of these tools and getting their message out in a, in a, a media environment uh, that may have been ignoring uh, a lot of the racial justice issues uh, that have arisen. Um, and um, and how has Section 230 played a role in helping their ability to organize online, online or, or, or has it hindered that in some ways? I mean, I think it's definitely helped just because of the way the platforms are designed at this point, um, because it just, again, lowers that barrier to speak. And so instead of having to go, to example, to a newspaper and try to get your message out, you can post it on Twitter. You can post it on Facebook. You can post it on YouTube, on all these different platforms, and it allows it to organically take off. Um, and I think that's an important part of these social movements that have uh, sprouted online. Yeah, and and to add, I mean, there's a lot of 
frankly, a lot of the stuff that we you know we like to say, you know, that that goes against, let's say, you know, like the the dominant political power that's in office, or that is, you know, we're we're trying to, you know, push things like the movement for Black Lives, you know, that's that's been historically a struggle in the United States. It would it would I can't imagine it not hindering social movements if I had to ask the permission um, of a corporation's lawyers to be able to say what I want to say on the internet. I can't imagine that, you know, if I'm trying to organize a protest in my community, I have to basically ask Mark Zuckerberg or, or whoever else, the CEO of a giant corporation, if they wouldn't please mind me posting that on their website. And so by, by shielding them from liability for those kinds of statements, you know, I can now go to those, these, you know, these gigantic forums, organize my community, Without without having to you know mother may I people that I think are you know gonna see a lot of that stuff differently if if they if they had to assume personal or corporate responsibility for everything that I, you know I want to say on those websites. Great, thanks, thanks. Um, so um, just bringing us up to some of, some of the current controversy around this in the last year, as I mentioned earlier, there's been this frenzy of activity in Washington by political players, really on both the left and the right. Um, seeking to repeal or reform Section 230. Gaurav, why do you think we're seeing all of this activity now? What's uh, what's going on here? Yeah, well, so so there's two there's two things going on. I think there is some very real concerns about very real harms that we. I think you know, in an honest conversation, we have to admit that this law is facilitating. There are like, revenge porn, for example, is a huge problem. Uh, there are websites that are, you know, shielding themselves from liability uh, by by people that are uploading, you know, really, really harmful things to those to those websites. Harassment campaigns are organized online, and you know, you know, there's a frankly a seminal case about Section 230 um, right after it was passed that shielded AOL from having any responsibility for for basically knowingly allowing a harassment campaign to happen on its service. And so those are those are real issues that that the law, you know, is is I'd say unintens unintentionally facilitating. The people that wrote it decided in in the end that balance is worth it. But those are discussions that are are I think very fair game to have about you know what is the outside you know how how strong should the shield be or what should the edges of that shield be. There is another I think uh, um, debate happening which is there is, you know, and certainly the lead up to the election, a lot of, you know, concern that websites are, are doing a lot to take down, for instance, well, you know, foreign, foreign propaganda, misinformation about the election, um, you know, uh, frank COVID-19 misinformation. Section 230 is what allows those websites to go ahead and take down speech that is otherwise, frankly, completely permitted under the First Amendment but you know, I think very obviously harmful if you're lying about you know the dangers of mail-in voting, if you're lying about um, um, you know fraudulent cures for you know the deadly pandemic we're in. There, there are people that would like to see much less moderation online. That would kind of want to open the floodgates to propaganda, bigotry, uh, you know, um, and and misinformation. And there's an attack on this law from that side, which I think is is truly dangerous. And that is, that's part of what's going on right now. Well, I, I, Soren, who's, who's, who's with us um, online, just mentioned that, uh, that, that FALSTA, which was an early, uh, earlier legislation that modified Section 230 protections in certain ways, um, had the unintended consequences of, of increasing the, the types of hate speech, calls to violence, disinformation um, on, uh, on sites that were being used as a refuge. Uh, for certain communities, and uh, and so um, um, it seems to be very much in line uh, with what you're. We're just saying there, Gaurav, uh, Car Carmen. Uh, so, sorry, did you want to respond? Uh, I mean, I think that's uh, that's right. I mean, that's why this is a delicate balance, and I think anything, any modification. Once like I said, there there are like totally fair conversations around the edges of that liability shield, but but. Unintended consequences not only are like a theoretical danger. I mean, as as Torn just said, right? A law that was you know perhaps meant to protect 
uh, you know, of the vulnerable community of the, you know, sex workers and, and trafficking victims has actually done that community much real world harm. And so, you know, it's, I don't, it's, it's awful to hold out a community like that as a cautionary tale, because I think there's much that can be done to, to go back and mend that problem. But it's certainly an experience that we should all learn from and say that, you know, futzing around with this law isn't something that should be taken lightly. So, um, Carmen, in, in addition to, to that legislation, there has been a number of other policy proposals that are at the mix, um, seeking to modify Section 230. We've learned a little bit about the unintended consequences of having done that earlier. Um, in this current crop of, of bills and um, FCC initiatives and executive orders, um, what is it that you think a lot of these administrators and lawmakers um, are getting wrong about Section 230? Have, have they um, have they been on target here in their criticism, or or uh, what's actually going on here? Sure. I mean, I think there are there are harms, right? You know, and especially when we when we talk about the edges, um, exactly what Gaurav was saying. But what they seem to be getting wrong, I think, is the history. Um, I think they it's it's something that's being glossed over, and I also think that they're what they want is to protect their speech and not have these platforms carry other speech. So they get very confused, um, I think, in going through and saying, this is speech that we think you need to take down. Everything else needs to stay up. And they'll start naming speech that is obviously awful speech. But then there's this whole series of hate speech and other things that they say that these companies cannot take down. Um, so there's almost this like must carry uh, piece to it, and some legislations do, and so it it kind of creates this. They want to, you know, use two thirty two bend to their political will, and I think that's what's really dangerous about some of these proposals, and why it would lead to so many unintended consequences. Um, and again, there's other ways of tackling these is issues online, and I think that's what we need to be thinking about, and not again fundamentally altering Section two thirty. Yeah. Uh, and another misconception that I, you know, I'm highly sympathetic to is that we, I think people lose sight of the fact that 230 is a liability shield. So, so that means it is a shield from an underlying legal cause of action. And I think a lot of people that, you know, frankly, we're friends with, um, and it's, it's certainly out there, uh, you know, look at a lot of the odious speech online, that, that lowering the barrier to speech has you know facilitated right certainly if more people can speak there is there's more hate speech there there is more organizing of truly odious actors around the world and in the united states let's let's go there but much of that activity frankly almost all of that activity is protected by the first amendment so we don't have if to th fixing 230 or or you know working on the edges of 230 can work if you can think of something underlying that is unlawful that 230 is shielding from. It, it, is, it is just true, um, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, that things like hate speech, things like, you know, uh, you know organizing, uh, you know, I, I think, frankly, pretty threatening, you know, Second Amendment rallies and things like that isn't unlawful, right? And so nothing, no real playing around with 230 is going to address activity that's not unlawful in the first place and certainly not stuff that is protected by the First Amendment. So that is to say, you know, perhaps there's room out there to have a conversation about, you know, what is and is not protected speech, but that should not be, it doesn't really make any sense for that to be part of the Section 230 conversation because, you know, people have the right to do these things. And that's, and that is, you know, a, a, you know, I, I, you know, I think on balance probably <laughs> the right Thing right. in the United States, but that's 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 how we have to remember. It's a liability shield, not a things I don't like shield, and that's and that's really important, actually. I mean, and just to again go back to the fact that Section two thirty allows these platforms to remove that content, yeah. even though it is protected, right? Yes. So if Facebook doesn't want hate speech on their platform, they can remove it um, without any liability because again, it's protected speech under the first amendment, same thing with those armed rallies. So I think that's why there are other solutions out there. Um, and I have to say that what, you know, we do have some proposals out there. They've been out there almost two years called change the term. And when we talk about change the terms, we, we wanted to 
tackle hateful activities on these platforms and figure out what are some solutions um, that would help these platforms. And enforcement of their policies in an equitable way is one solution. So if you say you don't allow hate speech, take it down from your platform. Yeah, and that's the and that's the the balance that we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, and it's interesting also that you mentioned um, Section 230 um, allowed sort of lowered the barriers to entry for speech, um, and as a result, some undesirable speech you know got into the mix. But it's interesting to me that um, the, the most prominent attacks against Section 230 are coming from the top, from within the White House, um, after President Trump uh, tweeted about uh, misinformation about mail-in voting. Um, Twitter took action, which prompted the, this executive order. So while you are having, you know, the, while there is this impetus to, um, for Section 230, um, Section 230 allows all of these voices in the, into the mix, the biggest threat right now um, uh, for disinformation and hate really seems to be coming from the top. And that there is a concerted effort in, in my thinking by um, the White House to intimidate uh, social media platforms to make sure that they stay on the sidelines and allow speech from the top down to get into the mix without without this sort of um, this ability to moderate, uh, fact check, or in other ways contextualize uh, their speech. Yeah, I mean, I call that the disingenuous attack on Section 230. Right? These are people that have no no want for a platform. Right? The, the president will 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 be platformed no matter you know what he does or who fact checks him. That's that's true of now. There's legislation in the Senate attempting to to pass basically what the president couldn't do by executive fiat into into law, and I I think you know as we mentioned this is a truly dangerous attack on this balance. It is it is what they want is to force platforms to to have to carry you know any sort of any sort of bigotry any sort of hateful speech and really you know. Aside from the political attack, which I think is is we have to discuss, it's really an attempt to make the internet basically completely unusable, right? If I want to have a discussion, you know, user moderated, forget the platform, a user moderated discussion, you know, about issues that are important to me or my community, um, what laws and this executive order would do is is kick the door open and allow anyone in, whether they're interested in in you know following the rules of my discussion or not. And I don't see how it's possible to to have you know communities where we can you know discuss the topics we're interested in, um, where we can you know like learn, grow, and do these things without without literally keeping a door open to any troll or or interloper that wants to you know kick the table upside down. It you, you, th that is actually an, an impediment to to speech itself, and I think that is an uh, you know an on purpose thing that both the president and some of his allies in the Senate are trying to accomplish with the executive order and these proposed laws. Yeah, and sure. I use that word dangerous um, because it's something that always comes, you know, comes to mind for me, but the other word is unconstitutional. Yeah. And it's the government telling these platforms who have their own First Amendment rights what they should and shouldn't allow on their platforms. So I think that is something that is you know, it's fundamental um, and it's, just, it's dangerous and unconstitutional. So, so great. So we have this executive order. We've talked about that. You've talked, Gaurav, just a little bit about the legislation uh, that was introduced um, earlier this month. Um, and we, now we also have a pro proceeding at the FCC. Can you describe a little bit how all of these moving parts seem to be fitting together? Where, where does the FCC fit into this and what is it that's going on there right now? Yeah, I know. I know people out there love DC procedural baseball, but here's, here's what's going on. So, so in response to literally in response to Twitter fact checking um, Donald Trump's tweets on its own platform, um, with, uh, false tweets about how dangerous um, voting by mail is, which it isn't. Um, they they added like a warning label on those tweets. In in response to that even happening, the president issued an executive order. Saying you know in in retaliation, saying that you know, basically Twitter shouldn't be able to do these things. No one should be able to. Well, internet platforms and users should not be able to exert any kind of moderating control on websites. The procedural aspect of that is the president can actually only force the FCC is an independent agency, 
force this thing called the NTIA, the National <laughs> Information Telecommunication Administration, to to petition the FCC to reinterpret Section 230. There's a whole host of problems with that sequence of events. One, the FCC has no jurisdiction over Section 230. The law is quite simple and, and is self-executing, meaning that it, it runs itself. It doesn't need an agency to facilitate its operation. It's an instruction literally directly to the courts to shield certain entities from liability. So, and it's, so it, it's, it's unlawful in what it asks the FCC to do. It is un, it's unconstitutional speech retaliation that, is, that goes against the First Amendment. It is, it is, as Carmen said, it is highly problematic, unconstitutional, frankly, like authoritarian uh, retaliation for a company directly contradicting, you know, the people in office. And so uh, uh, we have sued over that executive order for its unlawfulness in, in a whole host of ways, including, as you said, being inimical to the, to the Constitution and to the promise of the First Amendment. So there are those problems with the executive order. Now, his allies in the Senate, out of the Senate Commerce Committee, have have rewritten that executive order in the form of a law. It is still unconstitutional for a bunch of First Amendment reasons, but being a law, it, it raises a different set of issues. Would it pass? And I, I frankly don't see it necessarily passing, but um, you know, being signed into law, I don't think the Democratic House is gonna entertain you know, a, a power grab by the president but but you know, does it have legs? Does does the president and his allies in, in Congress want to be able to exert that control over what we can say and and can do on the internet? I think one hundred percent yes. Interesting. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, change of the terms and the work that um, we're doing with, in coalition to um, compel the platforms to have, create their own policies that uh, better manage, um, moderate, and in, in many ways, take down uh, hate speech and other dang dangerous, harmful activities uh, on their platforms. Um, now, so let's imagine a scenario, you say you, you, you handicap these various legislative efforts, the executive order, um, the FCC proceeding, um, some go up, but let's imagine a scenario where the this legislation is passed and uh and so what kind it, it, can we, in a little more bit more detail what kinds of harms to the open internet and uh potential uh the or, or what sort of you know increase in the spread of hate speech do you see should congress and the fcc um uh, uh curtail these these 203 uh, 230 protections yeah i'm imagining that was or is coming uh, Carmen, one, two. okay so so i I, this is gonna be a, a kind of funny thing to say, but let's put the First Amendment issues aside for one moment, because I just wanna, I think their ability to accomplish their aims is is stymied by the constitution itself, but you know, we have a judiciary that is defer deferential to the president. So, so you know, that, uh, that is a, that's a problem in its own right, but let's talk about what they wanna accomplish. And what they wanna accomplish is, as I said, opening the floodgates and making it, you know, unlawful for, you know, either users or websites themselves to moderate their community in ways that they see fit. So, you know, they, they want a, like a must carry regime for, for any hateful speech. They want to make it unlawful to take down um, things that they disagree with, things that are factually untrue, um, things, you know, uh, they make it impossible to clear, let's say, any forum of, of trolls and other bad actors that are there to just you know, kind of flood any discussion with with false, disingenuous, and and, and you know, propaganda information, um, in, in an effort to make it really impossible to discern truth from fiction online, and that's that's basically what what they're trying to accomplish. And I think it, it's I think we should take that threat very seriously. So, so Carmen, I, I, when I, oftentimes when I think about the work that that Free Press is doing and that a lot of our allies are doing on Section. 230, um, certainly the work that we're doing in the Change the Terms Coalition is that we, we kind of have this, this bad cop, good cop routine uh, with the platforms and that at the one hand, we have very strong asks with, uh, out to them about how they need to change their internal policies um, in order to better address the proliferation of hateful activities. But on the other hand, this is the good cop routine. We're actually defending, by and large, the one 
internet law that has allowed them to kind of create these communities. Do you, th do you think that's a, a fair assessment of, of you know, we, are, we, we have a very complicated relationship with these companies, um, but we're, we're very strong critics of them. But at the same time, we're, def we're taking their side in cer certain policy debates. I would say Section 230 might be one of those. Um, but is, is that a fair assessment or do you see it in a different way? I, mean, I think that's fair. And I think it's because of the balance and because of the nuance, right? Because we, we want to make sure that not only we can speak on these platforms, but that they are able to, again, address some of the content, the disinformation, the propaganda on their websites. And so without, again, being sued. So what if they do end up fact checking the president? Can the president then sue the platform, right? And so that's why Section 230 has this balanced approach. And we really need to keep that in mind. Um, and that's why with, you know, the change the terms um, model corporate policies, we went through and really um, carefully detailed what these platforms um, can do to better moderate their platforms and some of the things, some of the tools um, and some of the transparency that's actually necessary to do that. Because, you know, hate speech is one thing if it, if it lives online, but what we know and time and time again is that this hate speech leads to real world consequences. It leads to deaths, it leads to violence. Um, and so it's not just about the speech online, but what harms that causes in real life especially with the, you know, the COVID misinformation, um, the mail-in voting, and that that's dangerous. Like those are real world consequences. And so these platforms do need to step up and take responsibility for that. And Section 230 allows them to do that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that you're, you're uh, here with us at this live streaming conversation about Section 230 and hate speech. You know, we're very fortunate to have Carmen Scarato and Gora Laroya with us. Uh, both recently authored a piece for Tech Dirt, um, very detailed explanation of, of Section 230 and, and the threats that it's under today. Um, I encourage you to ask questions. We, we have time uh, to answer questions through the end of this, this session and would love to hear from you. Um, in addition, uh, don't forget to, um, to click on the link in the video caption. Uh, you can learn more about ways that you can support um, our work. Um, so I'm getting into uh, one of the final questions here, and it's really related to that, um, um, is, is really what you both think uh, people should do if they want to learn more about this issue, um, what sort of actions they have available you, uh, to them. You should might be also worth mentioning the lawsuit that uh, you mentioned briefly earlier and, and what that entails. Um, uh, we have um, resources out there about that and ways that people can, can support our work on that front as well. Um, Carmen, do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of uh, things that we're doing? Sure. I mean, one of the things that you just mentioned, is we did publish um, a piece in Tech Dirt, Gaurav and I, and we really talk about, again, how Section 230 helps these platforms fight hate speech. So that definitely check that out. Um, and on our website, we have a lot of resources um, regarding like the, the lawsuit. Um, you can learn more about what that means. Um, and there's also, we recently filed comments actually um, at the FCC that Gaurav led, um, telling the FCC that they really shouldn't be touching this. <laughs> so there's just a lot of resources out there to learn more about Section 230 and the history and why it's important for us to, again, to, to keep it the way that it is. Um, Gaurav, anything? Um... Um, uh, Carmen, Carmen said it. I think you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, visit our website, uh, read the piece, and you know, I think you know, get involved. As I said, there's a congressional fight to be had over keeping this law the way it is, and I think you know, as as you know, these discussions always end the same way. Call your members of Congress and, and tell them uh, what you think about Section 230 and the ability of you know communities online to be able to decide how they want to operate themselves. I mean, this is literally about user control over their own communities on the internet. I mean, forget about the ability of Facebook to do this. I mean, if those laws go into effect or the executive order goes into effect, you know, it means that, you know, any forum that users put together won't be able to be, you know, maintained by themselves. And that's, that's you know, it, it instead maintained by the FCC or frankly the president. And that's, that is, that's a, that's a terrible outcome, and we should all work to see that it, it doesn't come to pass. 
Great. Well, this has been really, really interesting. And as this issue is, I mean, we are in the middle of this issue. This is ongoing. We're going to be hearing a lot about this in the run up to the election. We're going to be hearing a lot about it um, after the elections. Um, and and um, I encourage people to engage, to learn more. We have a lot of great resources and some of those are available at the stream here. You can learn more, you can read um, the op-ed um, um, on Tector. You can uh, learn about some of the uh, work we're doing with regard to the lawsuit. We, we have a lot of materials related to Section 230. We welcome your comments. Um, we wanna continue this conversation. We hope to do more things like this so we can talk about Section 230, about internet freedom um, as, um, as we go forward, uh, this is a very contentious time, and this is going to be one of the signature issues, um, certainly in 2020 and, and going forward, regardless of, uh, of, of who's sitting in the Oval Office next year. Um, we do have a question. Um, okay, I, um, I have a question for you, uh, both of you. What would you like to see happen if you could wave your magic wands? Imagine if we had one of those. Uh, what would you like to see happen to Section 230 um, going forward? And the answer might be nothing, but uh, but uh, but uh, why don't we start with you, Carmen? So I think if I had a magic wand, I would make it so that we are not talking about Section 230 anymore and focusing on other things. I think that's um, that's what I would do because I feel like we're we keep on leaning on or not we, but some of you know some of the people out there, whether it be the government, the members of Congress, lean on Section 230 as the solution to all of our problems that are off, that are online um, or that live on these platforms, and that's just not the case. So that would be what I would do with my magic wand and just start focusing on things like change the terms. Yeah, I think I think that's right. So I've got two answers to this. On 230 itself, like these are these are actually pretty technical legal issues that I think are actually sort of interesting to, to resolve, but they're, they're right. Like what's the, the, the law itself says shall be not be treated as a publisher or speaker. Okay. So, so I think there's, there's some work in defining what treated as a publisher or, or speaker means in a more, in a more narrow sense, perhaps, as I said, there's real questions about harassment campaigns online that are knowingly facilitated by platforms. I, you know, I revenge porn, for example, is, you know, ruins people's lives. And I think, if you know that you're knowingly hosting it, yeah, there's a serious discussion we can have about, you know, if you if you're doing that, you know, organizing a website around harming people, then perhaps you can't. You should perhaps not be able to hide just because it's user generated content and not something you produce yourself. I mean, those those where those lines fall is an interesting sort of technical discussion, but importantly, this issue has become sort of a shiny object for a lot of policymakers, and I think we are selling ourselves short as far as the activists and re reform minded community by focusing on really like a, a pretty just sort of boring and technical piece of legislation. I think we should really be thinking about the underlying uh, ad driven structure of like free web services to begin with. Like, is this is this business model that's focused on attention really serving people and, you know, and, and the United States well? Um, why do the heads of certain corporations, like let's say namely Facebook, have complete, have like near dictatorial control over publicly traded companies, right? What should the responsibilities of shareholders be to that company? Should the company itself have more public facing obligations? There's, there are really interesting conversations to be had around the way these business models work, these companies operate and how we can get them to have more uh, socially responsible obligations and focusing on this law, I think, actually, actually, just stymies those, you know, more radical and more productive conversations that we should be having. Yeah, and I should add that Free Press has a, a number of those types of proposals in the mix. So we are doing this work on Section 230, and we are doing the work in coalition on change of the terms. You know, we don't see one single panacea, one silver bullet for addressing the power of online platforms um, at what we've often referred to as new gatekeepers, um, um, replacing some of the old media conglomerates of the, of the late 20th century. Um, so um, in addition to the that coalition work and to the Section 230 work, we do have a proposal out there that would provide, that would tax online advertising, for example, the type of uh, advertising that's really taking over the entire advertising sector and it's dominated 
um, by Google is dominated by Facebook. I think the two companies uh, together account for more than 60% of all online advertising. Um, and our proposal would, would place a tax on this kind of targeted, micro-targeted advertising to create a fund to support non-commercial independent media, which has suffered greatly over the, in, the, in the last um, um, the last several years, and certainly since the onset of the pandemic, where we've seen uh, tens of thousands of layoffs and furloughs in the in the news sector. So, so um, thank you all for all of this. And as you, as I've just mentioned, there there are a lot of different approaches to this, and I think they need to be in, done in a very coordinated fashion. Um, it, we have a lot of allies that are working on antitrust issues as well, and that's a part of the conversation. Um, and uh, this has been all, all been very rich, and I'm sure we could talk uh, for another hour on this issue, but our time now has, has come to an end. I want to thank everyone who is participating with us uh, in this conversation. I urge you to learn more about Free Press and our work uh, to disrupt online hate and address the power of these gatekeepers um, at Free Press. Net. And you can also follow us on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, to name two companies, um, uh, and stay up to, to date on our work. Um, uh, uh, we work on these issues. We work on issues of journalism and access. Um, we're doing a lot of important work around, around racial reparations in the media. More to come on that. I'll leave it there. And uh, obviously, I'm very involved in the courts and in Congress. Um, but um, thank you both for joining us. And thank uh, everyone for being a part of this important conversation.